right? So you're probably on our free practice site. So practice.ekgguy.com. That's our full practice site that we have. So register there um, and you could start to climb our leaderboard and start getting practice. But let's go to our question to review. So here we have an ECG that was obtained from a 62-year-old male with ischemic heart disease. He presents with shortness of breath and lightheadedness. Now this ECG shows a wide complex regular rhythm at 77 beats per minute. And this is most consistent with accelerated idioventricular rhythm, What was the which was the answer here. So why do we say that? First of all, notice that it's wide. These QRS complexes are wide throughout, okay? So they're clearly wide, it's regular. So if you look at these R to R intervals throughout, this is a regular R to R intervals, okay? And so that's where the regular component, so wide regular rhythm. And then if we look at the rate of this, we said the rate is 77 beats per minute. So how do we figure out the rate? Well, it's regular rhythm. So there's many ways we could do it. Let's look at one way. So if we count, we know that from beginning to the end of our 12 lead ECG that we have here is 10 seconds and 10 seconds times six is 60 seconds, which is one minute, okay? And that means if we count the number of complexes going across, multiply by six, get, that will give us an estimate of the rate. So if we do that here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So what you do is 13 QRS complexes, so ventricular activity times six is 78 beats per minute. So that's one way close to that 77. Another way you could do it is by simply taking uh, an R wave that falls near one of those, uh, the thick lines. Okay, and so if we do that here, let's use this one, and we find the next R wave there. So it's just a little under four uh, of the large small boxes. So one, two, three, and just under four. So you would do 300 over four, which is 75 beats per minute. So slightly greater than that. So right where a good approximation. Now, what other features should we uh, keep in mind? Now, the patient's history of ischemic heart disease also favors a ventricular over supraventricular origin, uh, a wide QRS, uh, wide complex rhythm. We talk about wide complex, we're talking about the QRS complex. Uh, in the context of that with ischemic heart disease or prior myocardial infarction, you should be considering a ventricular source until proven otherwise. In addition, the very wide QRS complexes here, which were 176 milliseconds, uh, would be another factor. The R waves that you see in lead AVR, so these R waves here, this is an R wave, would be something that favors it. You have the R and S interval, meaning from the R wave onset to the S wave nadir, in at least one of the chest or precordial leads, um, of being 100 milliseconds or greater. So essentially you would take from the onset of the R wave until that, and that does look like it gets to 100 milliseconds. Now there's a lot of other features that could uh, help you differentiate between ventricular origin and not. Now there is, you know, sometimes we look for atypical uh, bundle branch block morphology. It's the morphological criteria. In this case, it almost meets that where we look at essentially this R to R uh, prime. And if the R, the initial R is greater than the R prime in amplitude, that would be more uh, of an atypical pattern favoring more of a ventricular origin. Now, uh, maybe here, but you don't see it throughout. So hard to say, you know, there's a lot of other features that we look for as well. Uh, but these are the ones that you should be focusing on. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, this almost looks like a right bundle branch block pattern. So if you factor that in with, in this case, a left axis deviation, that would favor more of a ventricular origin. So if we look at the axis here, if you recall, how do we find the axis? So we'll clear this. So axis is found. Imagine this is lead one, lead AVF. These are the positive ends. This is zero degrees, positive 90 degrees, plus or minus 180 degrees negative 90 degrees. And so if you look at lead one here, so this is positive and lead AVF is negative. So if lead one is positive, there's another color here, that means we're going to be going towards lead one and then away because AVF was negative. And so that means it puts us in this region here. And is this a true left axis shift? Uh, does it lie beyond uh, negative 30 degrees? Well, how do we do that? Well, we look at another lead. So the other lead that we look at in this case, uh, is lead two. Lead two sits here at positive 60 degrees. And what is very convenient of lead two is that it actually is perpendicular, runs at negative 30 degrees. So if lead two is positive, 
you'll fall in this region here, one, or if it's negative, fall in a true pathologic left axis deviation. If we look at lead two, this is negative, and because of that, it's going to go away from lead two, which puts us in this zone here. And in fact, uh, the axis in this uh, ECG was uh, actually uh, negative, going to pull it up here for you, uh, the axis was negative 69 degrees, okay? So uh, this was a true left axis deviation. So negative 69 degrees, pretty much falling in this area here, okay? So left axis deviation. Other few things that could be suggestive of ventricular origin, we look at R wave to peak time, especially in lead two, and that's essentially taking advantage of ventricular activation velocity. How fast is this, uh, this rhythm actually activating uh, the ventricular system. So that's one thing. If it's a slower activation, that favors more of a, uh, a ventricular origin, okay? So there's that excursion of the initial voltage and terminal voltage that's looked at. We won't get into that here. And the other thing is we don't have a baseline, but a larger change from the baseline may suggest um, a more of a ventricular origin. So that's one thing to keep in mind. All right, so let's end by just looking at a few components because, again, the answer was accelerated idioventricular rhythm, okay? And so remember, you know, the STT changes are likely a result of that, but you want to consider it uh, clinically if needed. Now, accelerated idioventricular rhythm, just a few points on it. It occurs when an ectopic ventricular pacemaker rate is greater than the sinus node rate. It's due to usually an increase in ventricular pacemaker automaticity, but it can be triggered, such as from ischemia or digoxin toxicity. This is a regular or slightly irregular ventricular rhythm. You need at least three wide QRS complexes, okay? Uh, the morphology uh, is often similar to three PVCs, but you want to have at least three in a row to before you define this. And the rate, as we suggested earlier, okay, so this is a regular, often regular, wide QRS rhythm. Okay, and the rate is usually 40 to 100 beats per minute. Okay, sometimes uh, it can go up to 110 beats per minute. Okay, but usually anything above 100, we start thinking of more ventricular tachycardia. Okay, you may see AV dissociation and capture effusion beats that are common due to the competition between the sinus and ectopic ventricular rhythms that may coexist. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, and the one thing that we, we didn't mention just now was that, you know, the VA or ventricular act, atrial activation that could be coming from this. So here's that ventricular activation. Maybe right here you're seeing uh, this atrial activity that's occurring throughout, okay? And so that's the, the ventricles are essentially retrograde the conduction to activate uh, the atrium in those cases. And that's probably what you're seeing uh, from the notching in the STT wave segment. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. That's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something.